And then I told him, my yellow is yours, your red is mine. And he, hmm? Hello? Yeah, what about the article? Several weeks ago. What do you mean I have to make another Kate Corain video? Didn't I add everything useful I could in the first one? Forrester, come on, it's not... No, 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 wait! Ugh. I guess I have to make another Kate Corain video. So here the fuck we go. Apparently, Kate Corain, the Goodreads review bomber, did an interview for the same outlet, and I'm pretty sure with the same interviewer as the BIPOC author she targeted. Now, one of the reasons it has taken me so long to release this video is because I wasn't actually going to write it. I had made several attempts at this script and realized every time that to discuss Kate's experiences with mental health in particular, I inevitably had to make mention of my own, and that is simply not something I want to do outside of my November 17 poetry collection, Integrated Marketing. Anyways, let me try again. Besides, I have a fun little announcement to make at the timestamp on the screen and at the time of me writing the script, it's not season. So Navroz Pirozi to my people who celebrate, and at the time of mine editing this video, it'll probably be Kochakan, for which I wish a Bahar Gutli also. But for now, it's Honet the Kani time. If you want more context apropos of what Kate Corrine did, you can watch my previous video. And if a more all-encompassing breakdown of this specific interview is what you seek, you can check out videos by Reads with Rachel and Book Chats with Shelley. I'm not going to say anything revolutionary here today, let's be honest. I'm so late to the party, there is no party any longer. The tea isn't even cold, it's frozen. A full-blown ice age has managed to take place between the release of this article and now. But, regardless, let's set our Hafsin table. I'm gonna have some fun with themes today because gods only know there's nothing else to enjoy here. I'll start off a little nicer and softer. I know, an absolute cunt like me, inconceivable. But I do want to make the point, without delving into personal specifics, that I absolutely do understand what it's like to struggle with mental health issues, with neurodivergence, even with addiction, or at least a notoriously addiction-like mental illness. I recognize how certain mental health conditions can make you self-destruct, can make you burn bridges. I understand that. I acknowledge how hard those things make life in this world on their own, let alone compounded. I also understand living as a queer person and a Jewish person at that. I know how much vitriol those communities experience, on a personal level with regards to the form of the two. Side note, apropos of the latter. In my first video on the situation, I called Kate Corrine white. Although they undeniably pass for completely white, I didn't know they're Jewish. Now I do. And I don't feel comfortable calling Jews white, regardless of what they look like. White adjacent, white aligned, white passing, yes. Not white. Especially as a Gentile who was born in a country where Jews are not and were never considered white. Or at least that country's white equivalent, seeing as it does not have the Western concept of race or by proxy whiteness. A country that has had a history of some of the worst anti-Jewish persecution outside of Germany. Therefore, personally, I will not be calling Kate Corrine white. I'm not saying you shouldn't, it's very fair to call her that, and societally she has absolutely been socialized as white. However, again, for me personally, there is a historical context which makes me personally feel weird calling Kate that. They're not non-white to me, but they're also not white in the way they sans Jewishness would be. I will call them white aligned going forward. Those types of people are, for example, Southern and Eastern Europeans, Ashkenazim, the Irish, etc. That being said, outside of full-blown white people, individuals of white-aligned, non-white, and even BIPOC identity can, can be, and often are, racist to BIPOC and non-white people. Just like some of the worst queer phobia I've ever experienced, having come from other queer people, the worst racism and xenophobia I've ever experienced has come from other non-white people. Therefore, despite mine shifting the parameters within which I personally say personally one more time discuss the situation, it does not in any way or to any extent diminish Kate Crane's targeting of BIPOC authors. 
In fact, you can even argue that it makes it worse. Because stepping onto marginalized people as a marginalized person is such unfathomably low behavior. You know what oppression is like, even if not the sort that POC experience. Why would you want to perpetrate that against others? Unfortunately, that question is rhetorical because white and white aligned Western queer and disabled people will without fail weaponize the queerness and disability status against non-white POC and non-Western people, including those who too are queer and or disabled. I think this is a clear occurrence of that. Ugh, I'm on, I'm on. I need my bitch fix. Sar, throughout this interview, Kate continuously talks about feeling alone and like they had no one to turn to or have understand them in their struggle as a neurodivergent and disabled person in the traditional publishing space. And yet, those who would have understood her most, fellow disabled debuts, fellow queer disabled debuts, were the very people Kate targeted in her review bombing campaign with the goal of pushing them down to elevate herself. And yes, I do say their goal was pushing her peers down because if her goal was only elevating herself, they would have used their sock puppet accounts to only upvote her own book and not touch the other authors. Maybe we wouldn't even be here if that's all Kate did because likely nobody would have noticed anything. But no, the insecurity was so consuming that it overrode discretion, ethics, shame, and critical thinking, leading Kate to use the same accounts with which she review bombed her peers, including leaving this absolute gem under Molly X Chung's debut, to upvote herself, making it beyond obvious who our perp was. And that, to me, is the Damasory. I'm going to keep this section relatively brief. Kate lied. They said the affected authors have her blocked, and therefore she cannot reach them. This is demonstrably untrue, as several of those authors have come out saying. So what's up with that bitchy? Leaves a sour taste in the mouth for sure, I think. Second, at no point in this interview did Kate name their victims. Akana Phoenix especially should have been acknowledged. Someone who was hit so badly, they literally had to take down their book listing of Goodreads and start over. You couldn't even name the people you directly harmed? Mind you, they never did. It was always the authors affected, the people actually affected, the latter of which is particularly telling phrasing, quote unquote, actually. That hits my ear, like them making the roundabout implication that there were people whose allegations of review bombing against her weren't substantiated. Yikes. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, they say. We're not exactly going to follow the intended meaning of this proverb here, but more, old habits die hard. Walk with me. As we know, when Kate's spore was picked up, they invented a whole new human being to take the blame for her. Lily. We also know how that ended for them. Habibti couldn't even fake a DM conversation, right? Sorry. Sorry. That kind of tone should have been left back in Suma. What I'm getting at is, this bespeaks avoidance and a perpetual tendency towards failure to accept accountability. Kate did this when her schemes were discovered, she defaulted to a blame game to the point of fabricating the existence of a person. Kate did this in their lengthy written apology wherein they put forward their substance abuse disorder as a scapegoat, excuse and explanation for their behavior. And Kate did it in this interview wherein she weaponizes their struggles with neurodivergence as an argument for why she's not racist and why it's actually super fucking harmful to throw such accusations against other marginalized people. As if I didn't already posit an argument against that last point. With that, Kate Corain succeeds only to further stigmatize mental illness, substance abuse, and neurodivergence by essentially implying that those were the factors which led her to commit the acts of systematically creating possibly a dozen sock puppet accounts with the purpose of trying to tank her fellow author's book ratings. On a site where book ratings are basically arbitrary, Goodreads is not an official rating platform, it's just popular and garbage at that. It's so ugly, my gods. None of the aforementioned cause a person to become racist. Mental illness, neurodivergence, changes in medication, alcoholism would make it that much harder to keep up with all those accounts to begin with. The claim that some of the authors they targeted were on the wrong list at the wrong time is actually offensive. You're really trying to tell me that on a platform as whitewashed and milk toast as Goodreads, you found a list that had all of these BIPOC authors, femme aligned and queer ones at that? What, were you seeking out BIPOC lists? Why were you seeking out BIPOC lists if you were? And 
utter cop-out is what that argument is. And just another example of Kate poorly attempting to shield herself with excuses. Besides, they literally brought this up in their fake conversation with Lily. They were aware this looked racist. One thing I found to especially reek about this interview, it just really stinks super bad, is that at no point did Kate make mention of the names under which she made her views. I mean, Ose Young, Chantal, Shaharizad Moen, Shaharizad Moen, Shaharizad, Shahrizad, Shahrizad. His name is literally Habib. We cannot be 1000% certain these were all Kate's doing, sure. Because Kate never names anybody or anything. Accountability aversion, what can I say? But if we do take this as an assumed reality, in this screening alone, Kate has essentially committed yellow, black, and brown face. And even if we cannot pin them all on Kate, statistically speaking, we can definitely pin at least one, maybe even a few. So pick your fighter, I guess. I'm that uber blonde Norwegian Persian girly. Now, with Honeta Kani done and Etar completed Miss Hafsin, I think we need to sue that palette, but also bring this back to the cold, solid ground. What we witnessed with Kate Corain is a socio-historical defect. A surface flare-up of a cancer burrowed deep into the tissue of not only the traditional publishing industry, but of the system as a whole. A system of capitalism, racism, ableism, queerphobia, and marginalization, which revels in the bloodbath of competition. I don't want to make any conclusive or closing statements here, because I'm not wholly sure this is the end. Khane Takani is never actually done, I swear to God, and I certainly don't want to evil eye anything. All I'll say is this, Kate Corain ended up becoming a perpetrator of that aforementioned system of oppression. This was Spar from Anarchy on Page. Like and subscribe, but I did want to very quickly announce that my art and short poetry is included in just an absolutely stunning anthology zine curated by the wonderful Ahapni Vardanyan. It is entirely centered around Armenia and features countless Armenian, but also some non-Armenian, artists, writers, and creatives. Every penny made from split pomegranate will be donated to humanitarian organizations like Hike for Our Heroes, All for Armenia, and Kyrgyz, currently aiding refugees from Artsakh, which has only recently been ethnically cleansed by the settler colony of Azerbaijan. All the links are in the description. Please check it out and support the endeavor. And Shashon Hakalutu Nagavnijan, mwah! So, so honored to be a part of this. Besides that, follow me on social media. Yes, my Instagram handle is different now. Pre-order my books or check them out on ARC sites like NetGalley, Book Sirens, and Booksprout. All royalties earned from my duology will also be donated to Doctors Without Borders, the Kurdish Red Crescent, and all for Armenia. I'm still sussing out where I'll donate my poetry collection royalties to, but I'm looking into some indigenous Australian organizations and Ponzi and historical preservation projects if possible. Navros Pirozi and Bahar Gutli Bolsun, respectively, and don't do Damasari.